So keeping with the theme of the forum, Unleashing New Jersey's Potential, we next have a panel of business and policy leaders to explore business in New Jersey, opportunities and challenges. Joining me for this discussion are first Jeremy Farrell on the far end. Uh, Jeremy is special counsel. Jeremy is special counsel, managing director of development and community relations at the LaFrac organization, one of the largest real estate developers in the metropolitan area. Their holdings include LaFrac City, a 20 building, 5,000 unit apartment complex in Queens, as well as hundreds of acres across Manhattan and Newport in Jersey City. Jeremy previously served as Corporation Counsel for the City of Jersey City. Next, we have Senator Steve Oroho directly next to me, who is the Republican leader in New Jersey's State Senate, having been elected to that body in 2008, representing Sussex, Morris, and Warren counties. In addition, for the past 17 years, Steve has operated his own business, specializing in wealth management and financial planning for high net worth individuals and their families. Senator, <laughs> Senator, Senator Orho also served as a Franklin Borough Councilman and a Sussex County Freeholder. His current Senate committee assignments include budget and appropriations. Now, lastly, uh, we have Celeste Kitana, and Celeste is a owner operator of 11 McDonald's franchises here in New Jersey across several states. And she's currently the chair of the board of the New Jersey Business and Industry Association. She's a native of Spain and emigrated to Newark at age 10, where she was raised along with eight siblings, but at age 28 opened her first retail business, a clothing boutique, before opening her first McDonald's franchise in 1992. So thank you panelists for all being here. Okay, we're gonna start pretty broadly and then I'm gonna direct a couple of questions to each of the panelists to move through a couple of subjects. So the opening question we'll start with is, a year ago, supply chain issues and labor shortages were top news when discussing business challenges across the country and in our state. What factors are you seeing most impacting the business in our state currently? And Celeste, I want you to start us off. Well, um, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for having us having us here. Um, it was a, a uh, COVID was a definitely a um, terrible time for all of us in many ways. Um, we did have the pleasure of maintaining our, our restaurants open with a lot of challenges. Um, Supply chain has been devastating for our business. It, um, we're not able to get equipment, we're not able to get product, we're not able to, and the biggest piece that um, tackled us and hurt us, it was um, labor. We, we, we had a problem getting uh, people to come to work, and um, now it seems to be stabilizing a little bit, but it has not fully um, leveled off. And just we, the, the, the habits of people coming to work, and if they don't like coming to work, they just don't show up. So it has been definitely, so it's been, it's been labor, it's been uh, supply chain, it's been getting equipment. We're waiting for a grill maybe 52 weeks out. So if a grill goes down, you don't have 52 weeks, you have 52 minutes to get another one in there. So that, that's what, what our biggest challenge has been. Jeremy? Yeah, I echo your comment about labor. You know, it's interesting. We had the supply chain issue, but compared to the labor issue, it, it pales in comparison. So on the supply chain side, what we saw was the, the extreme increase in cost that, was, that brought to bear, but that's already subsiding now, and we're still struggling with this labor issue. And what it really comes down to is in the early days of the pandemic, we really were trying to figure out the best way to survive. And I think in a lot of ways, uh, government reacted well to that immediate crisis. But then as we started figuring some things out, we didn't pivot quick enough. And we had people stay home for the better part of three years. We had people really not interacting in normal ways in society for the better part of three years. And what that does is it trains people that 
they don't need to interact the way we did before. And now we're struggling to say, no, we have to get back to normal because what was going on in that, call it emergency period, was not sustainable. Um, and so I think in all of that, the biggest, I call it lesson because hindsight's always 2020, but the biggest lesson is you have to develop policies, including emergency response policies that always reinforce that there's gonna be a return to normal and incentivizes that return to normal. And Senator, you have both a service business and in the legislature, so I don't know if you answer from both or? Yeah, yeah from, a, from a legislator's position, I mean, one thing the government was doing was closing everything down. And thank God for smart people in, in the business community where, you know, quite frankly, you know, the business community given the hope of work, you know, working with Regina and Michelle Sikirka and Tom Bracken, what, would ha what was happening, and on a bipartisan basis, I know Senate President Sweeney, I called him, so we gotta do something about this, and, and uh, the idea of you know, how do we start showing you know, the administration that we can open up safely. So he asked if myself and Paul Sarlo, and I know then added Teresa Ruiz and, and um, uh, Senator Singleton, and you had put together the coalition about, and it was like 200, 300, that kind of, you know, and we de you developed all the, you know, reopening plans. And the first one we had was a reopening for how, how do we get child care reopened safely. Now, the administration will always say it had no impact whatsoever. But even Senator Sarlo, who's chairman of the Senate Budget and Appropriations uh, Committee, had said every time that we had a Zoom, the next day the administration did something uh, to kind of loosen things up whether it be who was considered essential employees. Uh, we had manufacturers calling and saying, hey, listen, we, we can't operate, and they need us for talk about the supply chain. So we were able to help you know, with that. But the, I think that one of the, the key things from the government was trying to shut everything down, and the uh, business community, through the work of all the different associations that you had, showed that we could you know, responsibly open up. And I to think that you know, we were too slow opening, but to, to think about how slow, even slow it would have been without that kind of coalition you know, coming in, that's what I, that's what I saw happen. And, and I think that coalition had a huge impact, a huge positive impact uh, on the administration, uh, showing as far as what the business is. And you know, because quite frankly, I don't think they would have asked for any kind of plans at all until it was more or less forced upon them. Yeah, Michelle and Tom and others did great work in terms of uh, advocating for those positions. Okay, so I'm gonna get a little bit more specific now. I'm gonna direct this question, actually, Jeremy, to you. Um, so there's no denying that the modern workplace has been refined post COVID and remote work is a reality, right, for many companies. So maybe you can share with us the impact you're seeing on the commercial real estate in New Jersey and how can we stay competitive in order to recruit businesses and employees who are increasingly sinking, seeking more work-life balance? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question because we are seeing a extreme change in behavior in the workplace. Office buildings are not being utilized in the same way. Companies are not renewing leases. New businesses are not taking on leases. And, and that isn't just a shift in behavior. There's a very real economic reality that spins from that. Not only does that impact revenues from a private side, but it'll impact tax revenues and how the government realizes many sources of income that spin off from that activity of people going to an office every day, eating lunch, getting dry cleaning. So it, the ripple effect of this is significant and something that I don't think we're truly wrestling with today as a state. But it's compounded by the fact that our state was already losing jobs. And you know, we see it, you know, in, in Jersey City, we have several million square feet of commercial office space. And over the last 10 years, we have not realized a significant renewal of space. And what that tells us is when you burn off the old lease, there's nothing coming back in to replace that. And that's many, many, many jobs. And so as a state, we have to start realizing that if we don't do something to encourage people to go back to the workplaces and to encourage businesses to come to New Jersey to create new jobs, we're gonna have to figure out how to make up that income gap. And 
Unfortunately, we, I think, will all agree, just raising taxes on the people that are here isn't gonna get it done. So what we think needs to happen, you have two ways you can go about doing it. You know, we'll spend a lot of time, I'm sure today, talking about the corporate tax rate. And of course, we are just not competitive on that front. And so the easiest way to encourage more jobs in this state is to become more competitive on the corporate tax rate. We're sandwiched between Philadelphia and Connecticut. These are places where it's easier, or let's say more cost effective to open up a new business right now. And we have to just recognize that geographic reality. But also, we have to look to the fact that doing business in general in New Jersey is just tough. There is that complex web that we talked about in the, in the earlier session, um, and it doesn't need to be, and nobody is benefiting from it. But we, at the same time, should not forget that there are a lot of reasons why people want to come to New Jersey. So then how do we amplify that? And if we're gonna stick with the structure that we kind of have now, then that means really bringing back incentives. We've taken a step forward to bringing them back, but now we've gotta make them work. If we're gonna stay in that rubric of having some sort of major corporate tax and having some of these complexities, then the other solution is to do that. Let's get a real incentive program that's simple to use and will actually encourage businesses to come here and open up their doors up. The other thing I, I think we, we, need, we could do as a state is figure out a way to incentivize that return to the office place. Because the X factor benefits of that are huge. They're, they're, they're the difference between having thriving economic or thriving commercial cores or having vacant spaces that then create all the opportunities for all the ills that happen when you have massive areas where nothing's happening. Yeah, thank you. So, Celeste, I'm going to ask you a similar question, but from a little uh, slightly different angle. Because um, when people hear McDonald's, um, they often think of a global brand with millions of restaurants and billions in revenues. But the reality is a franchise owner like yourself is really a small business entrepreneur with very tight profit margins. So maybe you can share some perceptions of you know, what's going on in your part of the world and things that you think that we can both take advantage of and we need to change. So in, 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 in our world, it's kind of difficult to work from, from home. <laughs> it's kind of difficult to make a Big Mac and to assemble a Big Mac. So I, I think that if, if, if there were um, an incentive to, to bring more people out into the workforce, and we, we could eliminate some of the, these burdensome tax that we can, because when, when I think of if, I, if I'm to make an extra dollar, and we work on a really, very, very tight margin. Our, our margins are so tight. Um, and we don't, we subsidize McDonald's. McDonald's is, is a global company, but we subsidize them and they don't subsidize us. So it's almost like a, a reverse uh, syndrome. But if we were able to just eliminate some of the crazy tax, some of the crazy uh, regulations, um, I, could, I would take those, that extra dollar and I would just hire, and I would just invest that money into, a, uh, into labor, into my people, into, into educating them further, into getting them ahead. We're becoming very high tech at McDonald's. Uh, all of our equipment is, is just, and everything is run with IT. So I would invest all that money in my people. And when people work, people feel great. Yes, we're not paying, um, a, a crew labor is not $50 an hour, but our Big Macs are not selling for $50 for a bundle. So if we could just look at it and be more holistic about this, this situation, we can get more people into work. And when people are working, people feel good. And when uh, a neighborhood, when they work, uh, uh, a working neighborhood with, with thriving people, it's a healthy and strong neighborhood. So I, I, I would just invest that money. I would not go out and buy myself a new car, mm -hmm. a new Gucci Manuli, uh, but, I, but we would invest it in our people and in, in equipment and in IT and more into people. And people is a great investment because you get a great return on that investment. You know, just building actually on that, what you were just talking about in reinvestment, would you ever think about expanding new franchising in New Jersey given the circumstances or would you look elsewhere or? Well, I have to go where I am offered at McDonald's. I don't have, I could look, uh, you know, to move to Florida, but there's a huge line. 
to, <laughs> to okay. move to Florida and buy a franchise in Florida. But I love working in New Jersey. I was raised in, in, in New Jersey. I love the state. I love the people. And yes, we're always looking to, to build more restaurants and, and grow. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Thanks. I know I like investing in Big Macs. <laughs> and my, my grandkids Bunny. love chicken McNuggets too. So, just so you know. Actually, Senator, so so let's turn to you now. Um, so, as a legislator with the day job, we mentioned financial planning. You've brought a unique perspective to Trenton um, in the legislature. Kind of, what's been behind the resistance in your mind addressing to address New Jersey's tax climate? particularly when it comes to business? And how has your knowledge of the political inside baseball impacted the advice you give to your clients? Well, you know, it's kind of like a, a persistence. You gotta, you gotta stay persistent and as persuasive as, as possible. I was with uh, Arthur Laffer up here. It's, um, you know, everybody remembers when Ronald Reagan became president and the, and the economic powerhouse uh, happened with that. Um, but, the one thing talking about, one thing I've always focused on is the idea of attraction of capital and retaining capital. And when you, you think about it, we were just talking about here between like Connecticut and Philadelphia and New York and whatnot, and one of the biggest things we can do is a grand slam. It's a grand slam when we have a New Jersey resident who's currently working in New York get a job in New Jersey. Because when people don't think about it, because and we talk a little bit with the remote work and whatnot, people don't realize that people, residents in New Jersey, pay New York, by New York records, $4 billion a year. All right? Now, the one thing we've talked about is where, you know, and if, if they had the job in New Jersey, or actually paid their income tax in New Jersey, uh, they'd actually get a tax cut because rates are lower. And interestingly enough, interesting enough, that goes into the property tax, or income tax goes into the property tax relief fund which goes for your property taxes, you know, for K-12 education, your senior freeze program, mm -hmm. also your veterans benefits and whatnot. So um, I've asked them in the, actually the administration, we, I've been trying to push, you've probably seen some of this in the, in the papers and whatnot, to push the fact that New Jersey should be very aggressive about that. New York has always been, all right? Um, and you think about that, for, if it's only 25%, that's a billion dollars. So a lot of it's a lot it's it's a lot of money. So the, the other thing is to think about, and you combine that with the, the corporate tax rate. If we're able to make the corporate tax rate more competitive here in New Jersey, therefore, and and uh, Regina was talking about the idea, uh, talking to Celeste about you know open you know um, investing capital. Where would you do it? Well, what happens? Everybody knows capital is like water; it follows the path of resistance of least resistance to success. So when you take a look at it and say, okay, if you know New Jersey companies, it's it's expensive to move, it's tough to move employees, but we don't get the growth. So when a business wants to grow, they're going to look they're going to look elsewhere. So that that's the first thing I think I would take a look at is the idea of the attraction and and retention of capital is critically critically important. And I'll just give one one example. When we got rid of the estate tax, I heard from everybody, you're going to blow a hole in the budget going to blow a hole in the budget. It's not going to get, I said, no, you go for a little bit of estate tax and you lose a whole stream of income tax. And obviously you get income tax when people have jobs, right? Here's, here's, here's the truth of what happened. In fiscal year 2017, the income tax was 14.4 billion. In fiscal year 2024, it's, it's projected to be 24.4 billion. Okay, $10 billion more. Now they're going to say, oh, you, they did the millionaire's tax. Well, that's only about, you go back, only about 500 million a year. Then you look at the bracket creep, because quite frankly, and we keep pushing the fact of indexing income tax rates individual to inflation like Ronald Reagan did 40 years ago, right? New Jersey doesn't do it, and we should. And quite frankly, even you do bracket creep, that might be another, that's, and I did the calculation, another about, it combined about $3 billion. So now you got like between six and $7 billion that is still increased. So did it blow a hole in the budget? Absolutely not. We ended up getting, and similar to what you know, Arthur Laffer was talking about, the idea of coming back to capital, and I just talked to an estate attorney the other day, and he said, you know, since we got rid of the estate tax, I have, more, I have clients coming back. I said, we need a lot more of your clients to come back too. <laughs> you know, but he said, I'm more coming back because, and, and they are paying say, their income tax. So if we were able to make the corporate business tax and the individual income tax more competitive, more capital, more capital, 
more revenue. Super. Well, let's build on uh, kind of some of the policies that uh, you were just starting to reference, Sandra, and, and I'll direct this really to Jeremy. Um, so you had an op-ed that was published earlier this year, uh, just before Governor Murphy's 2024 fiscal budget address. In that, you stated that the cost of doing businesses in New Jersey are turning new businesses away, and you started to you know, refer to this before, and particularly because of the CBT. So what have you heard more specifically maybe from the leaders in the commercial real estate industry about policies that need to change in addition to the CBT? So a major, major issue is one of just optics. We engaged in a process of vilifying industry and frankly vilifying the rich. And nobody wants to go to a place where they are gonna be demonized for doing what they're supposed to be doing. And so we need to create a optic of welcome to business and to capital, to the senator's point. Uh, and you know, part of that is by creating programs that do the outreach and that bring folks here and celebrate them for investing in our communities and in our towns, in our cities. The other thing that we hear often is simplification. It is just too hard to figure out what you're supposed to do, who you're supposed to do it with, and, and what the timeline is going to be to get to opening your doors and selling your product or doing or performing your services so that you can make your revenue. You know, in the op-ed, I call this the invisible tax. In places like New Jersey, the complexity to open and run a business has a, has a dollar cost to it. Some of it is the cost that we heard about earlier where you, you do have to hire specialized professionals. You do have to hire the specific lawyers and accountants to help you navigate the system. But some of it is just in lost time. The moment you decide to open a business and invest dollar one, you start investing dollar two, three, four, all the way up very quickly. And that time period from dollar one invested to dollar one of revenue, if that time period is elongated, the chances of you getting to success becomes less and less and less. And when people look at New Jersey, they cannot predict what that time period is going to be, so they cannot quantify that risk. Um, and then the other thing that we hear a lot about is this issue around transportation. And far too much of our state's focus is on getting people, and this goes to the senator's point, is getting people from our suburbs in New Jersey to jobs in New York. And we need to focus on how we get people in and around the state efficiently and cheaply to centers of employment in New Jersey. And part of that is picking those centers of employment. You know, New Jersey is a, is a state with so many assets. But in a, a lot of ways, we reject the inherent assets and then try to create others focused on historical uses, as opposed to being strategic and saying, okay, we wanna be a state that has pharmaceutical investment and growth. Let's figure out where the pharmaceuticals would be best served, where they wanna be, and then figure out how we pipeline to them talent resources and the infrastructure they need to succeed. You know, New Jersey was the state of, pharma, of pharmaceuticals. We were the state of telecommunications. We were the state of research and development. And over time, we've dismantled those successful industries and they have left. And we've, stuck, we've discussed some of the reasons why that has happened, but some of them are far simpler than people think, which is if it becomes too hard for people to get around, if it becomes too hard for these industries to identify talent, properly compensate that talent, and have that talent flourish with that compensation, they're going to leave. So that's yeah. what we're here. Thank you. That was great. We covered a lot of subjects there, but that was a terrific summary, I think, of some of the opportunities that we've got. Um, I'm going to ask two more quick questions and take any questions from the audience. Um, and Celeste, I'm going to direct this one to you because you were, as a, a small business entrepreneur, you, know, you talked about reinvesting in your business and employees, which um, is obviously an essential part of business success, but you're also involved in communities uh, where you operate. So I want to give you a chance to talk about that a little bit and how important you know, having these small businesses and communities are. 
So uh, reinvesting in, in our community, that's my, that's the pillar, that's the, what makes me get up in the morning and we do a lot of work. And if we had a lot more money, then we would do a lot more, more investing in the community. But if you don't invest in the community that you work in, um, you have to be part of that thread. You have to be part of that, that holistic uh, living there and, and they look up to you and I'm a Hispanic woman so I, I do business in challenging neighborhoods. And if I don't understand their lives, I don't understand the lives of my, my workers, um, I don't understand anything at all. And if you don't give back, you will not make it. Um, I'll just tell you a really quick story. In Irvington, a couple of years back, we had, there was a tremendous issue with um, uh, gangs. And they, we, at that time, our, our buildings were red and white. And they, one night, they, t they had a gang initiation and they tagged the restaurant. But tagged it so bad, but they tagged everything in that whole town. So I came in, it was Saturday morning, and I came in, I looked at it, and there was a bunch of guys sitting on, uh, standing up on the corner. So I just went up to them. And I said, I, uh, I said you know, I, I, I don't get this. I don't understand it. Uh, what am I doing wrong? Do I not do well in the community? I'm not a pillar in the community. What do I need to do? One little guy just said a couple of words and walked away. And some of the older guys, they said, well, um, we'll clean it up for you. I said, no, there's no need for you to clean it up for me. I'll, I'll do that. I, we, can, we have to have the building painted all over again. So then when, when um, they looked at me and there was, there was this little Spanish little woman, she's crazy, she must be doing drugs and I don't do drugs. <laughs> uh, and um, so then when we were, we were done, I looked at, at these guys, must have been seven, eight, nine guys, and I said, anybody hungry? Come on, I'm buying you lunch. So we went into the restaurant and we sat down and we broke bread. We have never had an issue with gang initiation in any of, any of our neighborhoods because you have to be genuine and you have to invest in the community. We have lots of programs that, that we do that are, that are just amazing, amazing, back to school and haircuts and all of these things. So if you do business in the community, don't just go in, pop in, make money and leave. Just become invested in that community and be genuine about it. It's not just pulling out your checkbook and writing a checkbook and, you know, writing a check and just, you know, thinking, oh, I'm good, I'm good to go. No, you have to be genuine. Mm, thank you, that's a great story. Thank you so much. Tough too. Yeah, well, I'll say. Okay, so this will be a quick uh, lightning round. Um, and the question is, if you had a magic wand and you could change just one thing about the business climate in New Jersey, what would that one thing be? And I'll start with you, Senator. <laughs> <laughs> Just one. <laughs> I've been in minority for 16 years. <laughs> I'd love to be in majority. There you go. Give me a couple months. Give me a couple months. <laughs> All right. so, oh, boy. That, that would certainly be one. Um, <laughs> all right, that's my wand. That's, okay. that's my wand. All right. So, all right. Celeste. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this, as far as the thing, if, with that, what we would do right away, quite frankly, we would look, obviously, at the corporate business tax. We'd look, and, and it's not something, a light switch, where you're going to change overnight. We have a plan, and the Senate Republicans put out a plan last year, and it included a whole bunch of tax you know, uh, um, reductions, um, and that's the plan I would go with. Because everybody said, well, why are we going to put out a plan? Because we'll get criticized for it. I'd rather get criticized for showing what we're going to do, so then when we get in the majority, this is our plan. This mm -hmm. is what we're going to do. So that would, I would do that with a wand. OK, thanks. Celeste. My magic wand would be just to make it a lot easier to do business in New Jersey and just for uh, get rid of all the, the, the months of, that it takes to for um, permits and, and, and it's just so difficult and I, we, we have to have a, a, a milk license to sell little jugs of, that's how ridiculous these, these, these regulations, regulations are. So just make it simple so that when you open the door you don't spend three months mm -hmm. trying to open your doors and, and with all these, these regulations. So that's, that would be my magic wand. <laughs> Jeremy. Yeah, you know, I, I hate to beat, you know, the same drum, but I would say we, we need to, to dramatically cut the corporate business tax. Yeah, because what the, 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 the economic spinoff that that unlocks, it, it's so major. OK, 
Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. So let me see if there's, uh, there are microphones. We have time for like one, maybe two questions. Thank you. Uh, great. What, what is the corporate business tax in New Jersey? How, how high is it? 11 and a half percent. There's right now, there's a, there's a corporate surcharge of two and a half, which was supposed to go away in two, 2021. And then, and then they extended it to 2023. Um, one of the things we had in our plan is get rid of it immediately, but it's two and a half percent. So they're going to come back. But look what Pennsylvania did. It was in your report. Right. Come out, come out with a plan to, to keep going down. And you know, obviously it's some guard, but it's at 11 half percent. Right what, now. what is it in Pennsylvania? No, they cut it. Uh, it's right around nine now. In Pennsylvania, they went to eight point nine, but they've committed yeah. to step it down every year, which is really what we're advocating in the five, report. Right? Yeah, to try and the, get average, the average in the average in the U.S. is five to six yeah. percent. So that really ought to be the first target, and they've moved to five. Their target is to get to four point nine nine. Pennsylvania, yeah. that is. Thank By the way, North you. Carolina, it's in the report, right? Two point five yep. percent. They're committed to go to zero. And they're doing pretty good. Yeah. And I hate to be the one to say it. We don't need to go to zero to be competitive. Yeah. Agreed. We get to five and hundred percent. Hundred percent. Yeah. Hundred percent. You know, if taxes are your issue, yeah, you know, right. maybe New Jersey's not your, you know. Okay, yeah. one more, Peter. Yeah, I think one I've more. Heard that. That's it. Yeah, one of the things which hasn't come up, but I think it affects all these things uh, right at the hip in New Jersey and its business um, environment um, is the problem of uh, public employees unions because they really create an alternate source of legitimacy that is at odds, in effect, with the state, its economy, and, and, its, and its elected government. And I think you know, a guy named Philip Howard, who um, is, is really a Democrat, I've known him for many years, recently wrote a book really questioning the constitutionality even of public sector employees' unions, whether it's teachers' unions or, or government employees. This is a huge, block in the middle of any type of reform, whether it's spending restraint or improving the business environment. Um, what do you think of that? Well, I, I tell you, one of the things, um, I was the, uh, one of the co-chairs with uh, Senator Sweeney and Senator Solo on the um, Path to Progress report, and one of the biggest recommendations we had, and it's at this, you know, whether it be the municipal level, the county level, the state level, was the idea of we needed to have a health, our health benefit reform, and also, the, you, everybody knows the pension uh, system in New Jersey has been has been horrendous, um, and the idea to go to a you know a hybrid plan like a defined contribution plan, um, you know partly defined benefit, partly defined contribution plan, and the, quite frankly, that would do a lot of stuff for the, the cost factor because the one thing New Jersey talks to you know, do a lot of talking stuff, and the pension plan there's a lot of good stuff. Bipartisan in, the, in that path to, in that path to progress, and the idea of going after the cost drivers, because that's what businesses did. Listen, we we don't have to make a new cookbook; we just got to follow the book that business has done 25 years ago. You know, this whole idea of process reengineering. I did that in in the corporations where I was I was at, and all we have to do is follow that kind of line and those the kind of benefit plans that we have. I mean, what they do is they 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 put. Unfortunately, you know, the, the handcuffs on employee, once they get to 10 years, then they're all of a sudden invested into, and into the defined benefit plan. They don't want to leave. Even if they hate their job, they don't want, they don't want to leave. You give the, and particularly younger employees, you give them a defined contribution plan that they can portability to go someplace else, I think that would have a huge, a huge, huge impact. Yeah. We could talk about education or, or NJEA. Yeah, I've never got endorsed, so I can talk about it. <laughs> but I'm, I am 100% school choice, competition mm -hmm. around the whole state. So that's well, why that, I never got endorsed. That'll have to be another uh, panel. <laughs> so please help me thank the panelists today.